You are listening to a Clark's World Magazine podcast with your host and narrator, Kate Baker. Greetings, Clark's World citizens. Welcome to the second to the last story for the month of March 2022, issue 186. As always, we hope that you're enjoying all these stories each and every month. We want to thank you for your ongoing support. And if you haven't been able to yet, we're hoping that you can stop by patreon.com forward slash Clark's World to see how you can become a part of this magazine each and every month with your support. Our story is titled Meddling Fields and is by R.T. Esther. R.T. Esther, who can be found at the website module10.com forward slash writing, splits his time between raising two young kids with his wife and trying to appear well-read in public. When he's doing neither of those things, he works professionally as a graphic and web designer in Dallas, Texas. So my dear listener, I hope you can sit back, relax, and let me tell you a story. History gave the people of August little to look back on. Whenever a report came that one of them had been spreading their own version of it, one of us had to pay those storied steps a visit. The latest offender lived on one of the strewn fields left by a meteorite that came down centuries ago to give the place its name. Neighbors feared he had been in contact with visitors from alternate time strands, putting him in violation of laws enacted after the meteorite's interlineal quality was discovered. He stood a stone's throw from his homestead, waving like a child as the inspector brought her flyer down. The vessel's rotors leveled sheets of grass underneath and kicked dust at him, but he kept at it. He had a meddler's grin. It exposed his chipped tooth while failing to lift the bags under his eyes. Even meddlers too young to have seen the August meteorite come down had the grin, passed down through the same mutation that gave them immune cells most suited to Sanctuary 2's biome. Halfway up from the flyer, the inspector saw the first sign of a fragment on the property. The man's August aeronautics coverall had been deep blue when she observed him from the air. Down here, it appeared much lighter. The space flight manufacturer native to August didn't issue coveralls in that shade. It had either been acquired from where, or the man had damned himself and everyone on the homestead to extended stays at the internment camp east of here. Perhaps fate's worse than that. Here now, he greeted in the outback's patois before lowering his hand. Hello, she shouted over the rotors, stopping six yards out from him. I would want to skip the frivolities this morning if that's all right. Are you who they call Timo? He placed a bony hand on his chest. Name now, Timo, here now. Then Timo is Pa, dead and buried. Gone to be with her who throw her the rock down. Name now, Timo, till the rock thrower call me to her side here. She smiled through his soft-spoken soliloquy as he meandered a few seconds more. There came the old itch on the nape of her neck. She met it with all the restraint she could muster. For this visit, she needed to be fully in her own mind. Finding a window to speak, she heaved a quick sigh and rested her cloak from the wind's dalliance with it. Timo, she fished a warrant from her fatigues. I'm Inspector Ransom Nutera, with the August Meteorite Recovery Mission. In my hand is a warrant signed by the Magisterium on Sanctuary 2 and the now and forever Sovereign Cletus New Dawn, the Infinite. It gives me command this morning to search your property for the presence of fragments from the August Meteorite, meddling stones as you otherwise know them. But first, widening her smile, she pocketed the warrant. Allow me to extend you a courtesy by asking that you come forward with knowledge of any such fragments you may have come across here on these pastures. Timo narrowed his eyes, an expression that made him look younger than his six decades alive permitted. Behind him, one of the compound's outbuildings towered over the others. Two hundred feet wide, its roof was without most of its panels, so it looked to Inspector Nutera like an unauthorized rocket launch being prepped. She scowled. Another inspector had recently been here in August and ventured close to a transient extra-local object, frying his implant as a result. A launch pad in working order, though common in the Sovereign's prime, was still dangerous in a meddler's possession. Beyond Sanctuary 2's orbit lay transients wanting war between their time strands and this one. Timo shook his head in a halting manner, making the inspector think he hadn't understood her. People had died for just failing to communicate knowledge of where fragments of the meteorite could be found. The August meteorite recovery mission originated from violent campaigns to confiscate the stones and exterminate ghosts of resistance they allowed in from alternate time strands. 
If that's a denial, she said, my sweepers will now check the premises for extra local particle emissions and be out of your hair within the hour. How's that? He nodded. She paid her flyer an over-the-shoulder glance. The rhomboid vessel was farther out than she recalled landing it. Taking a moment to visually confirm it hadn't drifted on its tethers, she whistled to her sweepers. The likely explanation she knew was that she had been channeled into one of them while grounding the flyer and hadn't fully resumed awareness of self when it landed. The sweeper began as a canine-arachnoid hybrid. Once old enough, it was fused to a geodesic carapace fashioned from recovered fragments of the meteorite. She had brought just two with her for this visit, judging from reports of Timo's brazen antics that a fragment, if on the property, wouldn't be hidden well. The six-legged cyborgs shot like bricks of rusted metal from their docks under the flyer. As they scuttled past her, she palmed the nape of her neck where a scar marked the place her implant was inserted years ago. An implant was a recovered meteorite fragment barely bigger than a grain of sand, fused to a transmitter that kept it bonded to other recovered fragments. The trove of research on the meteorite included the findings that linking its fragments like that prevented inspectors from walking across bridges laid by unrecovered fragments, tears of the fabric of the Sovereign's Prime. Softening his gaze, Timo's lips curled. Perchance in tea, Inspector. His case had been escalated once it became clear the recovery mission could no longer ignore his retellings of Sovereign New Dawn's conquests and events that followed. There were reports from the August Aeronautics plant of him passing out leaflets he had authorized. He had been recorded gathering children around various statues to tell them stories of the people in those statues that could only have taken place after they died. The mission pieced his confused versions of events together after getting word that he had begun speaking of the sovereign Cletus Nudon, the infinite, as though he were dead. What they found was worryingly similar to six near-congruent strands believed to have splintered from the sovereign prime shortly before he arrived on Sanctuary 2. That building without a roof. Having refused Timo's offer of tea, Nutera gestured toward the outbuilding that previously drew her attention. Scratching his coarse head of hair, Timma turned for a glance at it. Yeah, now, as the rock thrower be true, so I must be. He fixed her with eyes that modeled virtue. Old rocket shit. Then Timma's handiwork here now before the magisterium forbid it. She nodded, holding a thought as one of her sweepers crawled out of the hole in the building's roof. It scurried like a gecko down the building's exterior next, indicators flashing a sallow green on his iron nickel shell. Green met the shed was clear, no extra local emissions detected, no fragments discovered. Red, without exception, meant a fragment nearby, a meddling stone, a bridge from the Sovereign's Prime to an alternate strand. Nutera returned her attention to Timma. Did old Timma rid the shed of rockets once the Magisterium ruled them illegal? True as the rocks are, he did. And you haven't been collecting more of them for nostalgia's sake or similar justifications? She watched his eyes pinch together, considering, putting on the air of incredulity. One could never tell with a meddler. Seeing the second sweeper exit the shed through a tilt door, she channeled into its awareness through the bond between her implant and its carapace. Though her limited awareness, it gave confirmation that the shed was clear, both of fragments and transients, from alternate strands. She spared Timma a flat smile, hoping on the kindly fool's behalf that she would truly be out of his hair soon. Let's go have a look. Crossing after him into the shed, she heard laughter. His case file had indicated three children still live here with him, counting a grandchild. The floor felt damp. No light passed into the enclosure except through that cavity in its roof. The musk of fertilizer hung in the air. Where daylight shafted down, Machine parts glinted in heaps on the ground. Beholden, just junk fig scavenged from motor shop. With his eyes glinting outside the light, Timma lurked in her periphery. Nothing go up to the rock thrower from here, true as her. Laughter bounced off the walls again, pitched too high to belong to someone old enough for work in a repair shop. Nutera turned to regard Timma's hunched frame. Is that fig laughing? Fig rapped to none but the rock thrower since births, he answered, a hint of grief in his voice. Call him soon, Timma. Kin of my daughty, Sarawa, who rapped the standard fluent. She nodded, hearing about his mute son, but that hadn't answered her question. 
It wasn't for lack of trying on the sovereign's part that after 90 years, people in August hadn't accepted his standard as a first language. After all, if Sanctuary II was forced to adopt it, dissidents previously executed in the Strand began turning up in August. In their native dialects, they regaled its populace with retellings in which Sanctuary II's invasion hadn't succeeded. New Terra glanced another few seconds at Timma. The silence between them filled her mind with images of transients being chased like fugitives through fields of hay. She had been too young to attend the public executions where those captured were hung alongside meddlers they had come into contact with. Though a bygone era, the rule remained. The killings, whenever deemed expedient, now happened in private. Timma shifted his weight from one foot to the other, slight but enough to betray that he was blocking Nutera's view of something. What's behind you? With that penetrating stare of his to the ground, he inhaled deep. Between his feet, she spied an object like a dome under a weathered mass of tarp. She rounded him to get to the other side of it, keeping his trembling hands in the corner of her eye as his gaze followed her. The object reached up to their knees under the tarp, spanning twenty feet between them. She eyed him with care to hide her apprehension. Do you mind? He muttered something that could have been a prayer in his language or a curse. In a swift motion, he pulled the tarp back. Nutera clenched her jaw at the object under the tarp and the pit it had been lowered into. One misstep and she might have fallen in. More to her displeasure, she was now looking at a small passenger capsule and a platform underneath. Only capsule you'll find, Timma stammered. No booster. You expect me to take your word on that? You hitching this thing to a platform and lowering it down this far while you have nothing to hide? It's for my grandy. Your grandchild? To pretend she's sailing. Playtime true as her. No rockets here. A metallic belch issued from down the pit where Nutera couldn't see. She began wondering what Timma had muttered in his language before moving the tarp. They eyed each other. The squeaking continued a few seconds more. After a muffled thud, the pit fell silent. Nutera hummed a sigh. Mm. How long will it take to crane the rig up to the ground level so I can see for myself? Timma chortled and it made her cock an eyebrow. More than the hour you timed on staying? I'll start now, in that case. He wiped the shed with his gaze, stopping beside its tilt door, where a slab protruding from the wall held a control module with its screen idle. After a nod from Nutera, he shuffled toward it. She wiped sweat from her brow as he keyed in commands through the screen. The ground shook. A hum commenced. The muck under her boots began to feel like it might pull her in. Best be outside till it's done, Timma shouted over the hum, peering behind his back at her. She paid the advice of a begrudging nod and began haltingly toward the door. At the door, she let him exit first, ducking cautiously under it once he was at a safe distance from her. Before she was fully out, laughter echoed again. This time she traced it to two children no older than seven, like mirror images of each other as they scrambled out of the shed behind her. She froze. They beat their little legs past her to the main building 40 yards out. Without hesitation, she channeled into the awareness of the sweeper closest to her. She felt its six legs like they were hers, the channeling so abrupt she lost balance on her own feet and fell. Memory of encountering the kids inside the shed flashed vividly enough that it might as well have been hers. They were identical. They had been playing under the module when the sweeper tagged them as native to this strand. Even children from outside the Sovereign's Prime couldn't be spared once identified. Timma, she mouthed, shaking herself out of the sweeper's awareness. Your case file doesn't list a set of identical... She paused at the sight of him, offering his hand to help her up. She should have brought more sweepers. If these two had erroneously cleared a transient, the entire compound could truly now be dangerous ground. A transient of unknown design could fry her implant, leading to brain death, her body in the strand, her mind in that in-between void where time moved in no direction. Without Timma's help, she shuffled back to her feet. You just have one grandchild who looks like that, and she doesn't have a twin. She was her. Well, who was that with her just now? Friend of my grandy. His eyes roamed, darting frequently to the sidearm holstered to her waist. Some call them twins, but they just friends. True as her. New Terra sighed in annoyance at meddler beliefs that refused to die. True as who? Her. A rock thrower. Timo puffed his chest up. 
her who threw the rock down. There's no rock thrower, Timma. There was a meteorite. We call it the August meteorite. It fell a century before the Sovereign's advance on Sanctuary 2. When the atmosphere broke it into pieces, it rained chaos on August, creating bridges to and from time strands, not ours. It's a cosmic anomaly, not the work of some savior destined to reverse history's course as it concerns you meddlers and your insistent Sanctuary 2 was yours first. This goes beyond religious conviction into real politic. Do you understand? If you can keep a knowledge of a fragment from us, you'll be interred the rest of your life, if not executed. If there's a transient here, even one as young as those two I just saw, they'll be executed. I can try explaining this to you in that pigeon you speak. Nodding and looking away, Timo raised a hand as if to stop her onslaught. She followed his gaze to the main building. There, amid its rubble masonry, she saw the sweeper she had just channeled out of climbing to the roof, indicators green on its carapace. Beside it, a shirtless young man stumbled out of the building's arched entryway. He held a tray, while behind him a slightly younger woman in a frock rushed two mugs to him. Fig and Sarawa? asked Nutera, matching their faces to photos of Timma's youngest children. Timma beamed a wide, unrepentant grin at her as the shirtless man bounded toward them. T, Inspector. Here now, these fields be as unkind as we agree to let them. Timma breathes deeply after his first sip. Views differ, but I meme the golden rule. You get out what you put in. Nutera stalled when it was her turn to grab a mug from Fig's tray, eyeing its creamy content, steam rising like a charmed snake from it. Beside her, Timma continued his small talk, while the noise from the shed kept on at a reduced volume. Fig nudged the tray toward Nutera. Both men had the same protruding stare, but Fig's was more commanding, as though he'd learned to carry conversation with his eyes. To Nutera, those eyes seemed to assure her that he had slipped nothing in the beverage. She took the mug, thanked him under her breath. Clipping the tray below his armpit, he backed away so the new trio now stood in a circle. Timma was talking about new printers at the plant when New Terra returned her attention to him. Glancing at Fig, a second later, he switched seamlessly to his native tongue. He must have shared a joke with him next because the man doubled over suddenly in mime laughter, eyes wide, muscles stiff as veins bulged on his brawny frame. He used his fist to respond in a sign language, equally impenetrable to New Terra, and barreled toward the main building. New Terra dismissed the thought that the joke had been at her expense. The tea smelled like ginger, but she felt no rush to try it. At the building's entrance, Sarawa caught her eye as Fig vanished behind her. The woman was dainty with sharp features that made her look like chiseled stone. She waved at Nutera. After a brief hesitation, Nutera waved back. You have a lovely family, Timma. They's my youngest, he replied. For venture, you crossed a port country up north, asked after my firstborn, stationed there three years. It was Sir Timma. She got high ranking with global defense, true as her. Left her daughter here to come up how she come up past her in life. Would that be your grandchild? Or the friend who looks... Nutera, tittering as mounting disbelief, threatened her resolve. Strikingly like her? As if he hadn't heard her, Timma resumed his philosophizing about life on the steps. Here, now, these fields don't grow crop if you don't let them grow you up first. Many give up and cross to poor country or lake valley below. No patience with the rock thrower to learn how to till the earth until she mark as ours. Then Timma tell the stories before he gone. Before the folks who crossed from here, before Inzi come down from orbit to lay Cletus, the enemy commander, low. Nutera huffed so audibly it made Timma jump. Inzi was a name without a historical person attached to it in the Sovereign's prime. However, in about six other strands, she loomed large. In each of them, according to legends that bled into the strand years ago, she had cut down Commander Cletus New Dawn before he assumed his immortal form. Timma, there's no Enzi who came down to lay the sovereign low. She pitched his daughter a quick glance as if to confirm with her what she'd just heard. You're a very confused old man. That or it's something worse for you and everyone else here. We'll know soon, but for the sake of disclosure, you should know that speaking of the Sovereign as if he's dead is the reason I'm here this morning. She bent her head at Timma's unnerving calm. 
You're so unassuming, yet we have these reports of you spreading apocrypha, the likes of which nobody's encountered since the recovery mission got its start. Timma nodded. Again, she wasn't sure. He understood her. That's all you have to say? He downed his remaining tea, then raised a finger. Perchance and I excuse myself, Inspector. Very quick in the house and back. Very quick. Go, she shot back. He scurried toward the main building. Don't wander too far, she called after him. I would hate to waste an extraction request on you and we find nothing on your property. With his back to her, he waved as if to shoo her away, barely acknowledging his daughter as he strode past her into the house. The woman threw Nutera a hard glance. Nutera turned her back so she could channel undistracted into the sweeper currently inside the compound's garage. On six legs, she scaled a compactor and thought, as I did once, that she would have done well if born a sweeper. Its eight bulbous black eyes pierced the surface of things, till all it saw was a soup of quantum ephemera, inside which particles that didn't belong stuck out like artifacts in the blue, extra-local emissions. At times, she channeled so deep it felt like she swam in a numbing sea, and all that broached her own awareness was bliss. No pesky meddlers exhausting her patience. No faculties of cognition complex enough to have her questioning the mission. She sensed a presence behind her, and knew this wouldn't be one of those times. Shaking her hand discreetly, she shook herself out of the sweeper's awareness. Inspector, came a lilting voice. She whirled to meet it, her hand itching for her sidearm. Sutterwa's frown was oddly enchanting up close, and it knocked her breath from her. Sutterwa, did I interrupt something? Nutera wiped sweat from her brow. Not at all. Sutter was lips curled up, but Nutera could only read torment on them. So it isn't true you all develop a dependence on channeling that slowly erodes your senses? Recalling her confusion of where she landed her flyer, Nutera huffed. What do you want? To ask why you're here? Nutera took a moment to resume her even keel. Your father's playing a dangerous game, Sutterwa. If there's a transient on this property, we may not even have to prove one of you knew about it. Sarawa nodded, that torturous smile still on her. Have you considered that it might be you getting history wrong? That's nonsense. When time came for the Sovereign to redeem his claim to this moon world, it was discovered that your forebears had been squatting here and had neglected to inform the rest of civilization. After they got tired of warring with him and chose to hear reason, they neglected again. In true meddler fashion, to tell anyone about this thing that came down a century before he arrived and turned August into a haunted plain. I'm here on his orders to prevent war with adversaries he can't properly anticipate because they strategize outside his prime. This morning, as it's been for some time, we're doing what we must to prevent death on a scale previously unseen. This time strand, an untold number of alternates connected to the Sovereign's journey here 90 years ago. Don't put on airs. Knowing exactly what I asked, why'd you choose this version? Nutera clenched her jaw as a grudge she'd held since birth threatened to surface. That's enough from you, Sarawa. The woman held her hand out. It took Nutera a few seconds to understand why, then hand her the untouched tea. While Sarawa gulped it down, a thought crossed Nutera's mind and stirred tremors in her chest. She folded her arms as the woman began toward the building. I couldn't help noticing you didn't deny there being a fragment here. Sarawa turned to pitch her that bewildering smile again, Will, backing away. I'm not my father. I won't dance for you. Nutera looked away. It's nice meeting you, Inspector. Inspector Ransom, Nutera. Hmm. The grandchild answered to Sunua, whichever the two girls she was. A minute after Sarawa entered the house, they ran out, flitting past Nutera without a glance at her. She watched them frolic in a clearing beside the shed, mindful of the three now inside the house. They played a clapping game that involved a tongue twister in their language, teasing laughter every few seconds. Reminding herself that her sweepers had cleared both of them, Nutera began pacing in their direction. They stopped their game when she crossed within a few yards from them. Sunua, she called, stopping as well. A moment passed as they eyed her obliquely, 
like they'd never had to decide who would respond to that name. Nutera squatted down, adjusting her plaited brown hair in an effort to look disarming. Come here, Sunua. The one in a leotard snuck another glance at the one in overalls before ambling toward Nutera. Her expression was bashful, but she flashed Nutera an enormous grin when she reached her. That's your name, isn't it? Nutera asked. The girl nodded, hands behind her back as she rocked gently. Her missing front teeth captivated Nutera. Nutera glanced over the girl's shoulder. Who's that you're playing with? The girl didn't answer. Come, Nutera called, waving the other girl over. She came close, flashed a timid, gap-tooth grin to match Sunua's. What's your name? asked Nutera. Karua? Suni and Karu. Nutera's smile came unforced for the first time since she arrived. Karua. Her mirth regained its artificial quality as she tried for a wistful hum before levying her next question. Do people tell you how much you look like Suni? Karua nodded. Why do you think that is? I don't know, the girl said gingerly. Do you live here with Suni, or are you just visiting? Here. Nutera batted her eyes at the girl. She had never encountered a transient this precious. This wasn't one, she reminded herself. Her sweepers had checked. Where's Ma and Pa? Karua. New Autumn? The girl mumbled through her smile. New Autumn Reserve. An image of two adults getting violently separated from their infant child flashed in Nutera's mind. The internment camp. Karua's smile faltered. Nutera lingered on that image. The infant child, only a few minutes old when sentinels hired by the recovery mission, dragged her parents out of the birthing ward. Burying the image, she regarded Sunua. What do you think of your grandpa, Sunua? Sunua was no longer smiling. Nutera hadn't noticed the grim look in her eyes till now, as though she too had seen something upsetting flash in her mind. Don't run, the girl muttered. Nutera pinched her eyes together. What? A smile lit her face up, masking horror underneath. What does that mean? She thought that the girl might be speaking the standard in that same broken manner as her grandfather. Timma doesn't... run? Don't run, echoed Karua. She too had stopped smiling, as Nutera searched for context within which such instruction wouldn't be cause for alarm, the girl spoke again. You're not completely across the bridge. A chill coursed through Nutera and made her woozy. Bridge. That was what the girl said, delivered in perfect standard. She bolted up, staggered back. The word could only mean she was no longer in the sovereign's prime. Her heart pounded. She almost fell, backing away from the girls. They stared vacantly while the world reverberated in her mind, forcing her hand toward her sidearm. Not completely across. No one had ever conceived of a bridge that could hold someone on it, rather than pass them instantly to another strand. A childish prank, she tried telling herself, but before becoming aware of it, she had drawn her sidearm and began choking its grip. Timma! She bellowed, the main building in front of her again, the sidearm pointed down. Not at the girl, she made sure. Timma, come out here! Shortly, Inspector, came his hoot in response. The second, you doddering old moon creature. Just another minute. Right, this something on her left caught her eye. She hadn't landed her flyer so far off the compound, yet there it was. What it posited now, she refused, breathing harshly while her head throbbed and the floor felt like it might drop from under her feet. No bridge had been discovered stable enough to return anyone who crossed it into another strand. She tried telling herself she was still in the Sovereign's prime, Timma shouted in what she now realized was perfect standard. Inspector, I think one of your sweepers found something. The sweepers. She focused on the implant behind her brainstem in order to channel it into one of them. If they had discovered extra local emissions, she would have sensed it when they did. The channeling attempt failed, giving her severe chills and a rush of blood to the head. She thumbed a lock on her sidearm to set its payload to lethal. The film of sweat under her nose took on a blood smell. She wiped the nosebleed on the back of her hand, nodded her resignation at the turn of events. 
Meddlers, come, she barked, taking quick aim at the entrance. Come out here, all of you. Lay down your weapon, returned a new voice, velvety, rattling her for how similar it sounded to hers. Her stomach dropped as, through the entrance, I took my first step outside. Ransom new Terra, I said, completing my exit. Don't be so quick with that or you'll kill your own ghost before she's had her day with your sovereign. She squeezed her eyes shut, opened them, shook her head. Having failed to wake herself from the dream she hoped this was, she trained a pleading look on me, mouth agape, chest heaving as her breathing grew difficult. One of her sweepers squirmed in my arms, smearing its sweat on my coverall. Fidgety beast it was with its carapace removed, spiked fur, a falsiform pate with its eight bulbous eyes. Fig walked up beside me with the other sweeper in one arm and its carapace dangling off the other. He tossed the carapace and landed halfway to ransom my soon to collapse doppel. You might still need that, I signed to Fig, briefly able to get a hand free. His eyes went to the net hanging off a string around my wrist. We have too much already, he signed. Ransom, sidearm still pointed at me, gazed finally at that net. Seeing the 19 meddling stones like flints of polished rock inside it, her eyes rolled back and she fell unconscious to the ground. Whenever a report came that one of the meddlers had been spreading their own version of history, one of us had to pay these storied steps a visit. Years ago in my native strand, I defied that order, embarking on this endeavor instead. It's now Ransom's turn to rebel. What would my name have been had the recovery mission not whisked my parents away to be burned for their fragment collection? I glance at Ransom Prime, my spitting image. She has no answer to that, only tears right now. Minutes ago, my sweet Sarawa, seeing her finally awake, entered the makeshift operating room and broke the news. We had to surgically remove her implant when it looked like she was minutes from brain death. She held herself and bawled into the mattress while Sarawa tried to comfort her. I waited out the worst of it outside. I wouldn't have been able to relive that moment when, learning I would never channel into my sweepers again, the withdrawals began. You know the story, I tell her. My story as well as hers. The infant barely minutes from her mother's womb. You don't think about it, but it's always with you. You come from meddlers. The sovereign here killed your parents before they had a chance to tell you your name because he never learned it himself. You were spared and conscripted into service as one of Sanctuary 2's child spies. I sit at the foot of the mattress as she sobs. She rests her head on Sarawa's chest, her shoulders like an engine failing to start. In my native strand, I've been here, on a similar bridge, stable enough to have enveloped the homestead over time. My strand was also called the Sovereign's Prime until another ransom new terror entered it and followed steps to kill the technically immortal Cletus New Dawn. They were going to name you Insi, I tell this one. Insinaga, Sir Amat. She pulls away from Sarawa. Sitting up, she takes a moment to halt her sniffling and nods. Right about here is where I too began to understand. Insi who came down to lay the enemy commander low. Ransom Prime faces me and, for the first time, doesn't see just herself. She sees someone so inevitable as to barrel through legend and truth in search of her. You know what it means, I ask, watching her close her eyes the same way I did, a lingering disgust at myself that can't be helped, makes me consider denying her its meaning. You shouldn't. You don't speak the language. You went to great lengths to make sure you didn't pick up any of it so you never be reminded of who you are. I did that as well. A new round of tears well in her eyes, triggering unpleasant memories inside me. Age six was when I had it ingrained that my parents had spoken a language that conditioned them toward rebellion and led to them choosing their meddling stones over me. In Sin Naga. I get up and move closer toward the room's window so I don't have to face her. Stone of us. Our stone. I consider telling her about Timma's meddling stones, up to 19 now and momentarily in my possession. They've been smoothed into a distinct variety of shapes that, 
when held together, unlock configurations able to shield both the stones and any transients around them from detection. Where she's going, all we know about the August meteorite and have kept to ourselves will be revealed to her. Through the window, I see her ride there, the launch pad inside the shed with boosters and a passenger capsule, now ready to board. When she's ready, she'll slip into a pressure suit without protest while I swap my coverall for her fatigues and burgundy cloak. Inside the shed, she'll board the capsule, willingly, and smile. I hope you're right about this working, she'll say. Now this bridge we're on goes to many places, I'll explain while helping her with the safety belts. When the girls warned you against running, they were only worried you'd end up in a strand too alien for you to survive. Though the girl doesn't know the extent of it, Karua escaped a strand where her own grandpa Tima and her parents were interred and later executed. This endeavor isn't without risk, I'll add. Six miles in the air above this compound, the bridge connects to a strand where a station orbiting Sanctuary 2 takes us in till we are fully recovered, then sends us out to infiltrate more strands. Outside the shed, I'll be joined by Sarua, Fig, Tima, and the girls. Together, we'll watch Ransom Prime lift off, then slip out of this strand. I'll kiss Sarua and the others after that then, with the sweepers in tow walk the roundabout path leading safely back to the flyer. Again, you can leave us a comment or a question on the story that you've just heard. If you go to the Clark's World Magazine website, the About Us page, it has our contact information there. We truly enjoy bringing you these stories each and every month. We have one more left for you, and then April brings a whole new slate. I do hope that you can come back and listen very soon. Until then, my dear listener, I do hope this finds you well, and I bid you a very fond and hopefully very temporary farewell. <laughs>